you to ask about how people can get a hold of you. All right, awesome. Well, thank you for joining us today. As we now begin the month of February, and with the topic of heart health, um, there's no one I'd rather interview than the paleocardiologist himself, okay? Um, I'm very stoked about this interview because cardiovascular health is something we take very serious in our clinic. And today, we're gonna take a closer look at the root causes of heart attacks, strokes, um, visit some clotting factors that completely escape traditional medicine. These are what I call true silent killers. But before we get into that, please allow me to introduce our guest, a board certified cardiologist. With over 14 years of practice, he was the senior partner of a multidisciplinary team that specialized in performing angiograms, pacemakers, and cardio ultrasound. In 2012, he opened Wolfson Integrative Cardiology, in which the emphasis is now placed on reversing prevention and discovering the underlying root cause using methods of nutrition, supplemental support, healthy lifestyle, detoxification, and staying healthy and resilient by avoiding chemicals and environmental toxins. It is a true honor. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Jack Wolfson. Oh, it's a pleasure to be on with you, Dr. Gabe. I appreciate the opportunity to share the message of holistic heart health and wellness. And, you know, once again, it's one of my passions, of course, to bring a holistic approach to the world. And that's what I do. So I, once again, I appreciate being on your show. Awesome. Yeah, it, it's very, very necessary today. I mean, it's never been a time whenever we need uh, more holistic answers. And uh, thank you for joining us. So before we get really into it, I'd like to just tell our, tell our listeners just a little bit more about yourself, if you would. Yeah, sure thing. I'm a, as you mentioned uh, in the intro, I'm a board certified cardiologist. I went through four years of medical school, three years of internal medicine, three years of cardiology. I became a cardiologist, uh, just like my father, which was always one of my lifelong dreams. And uh, as I became a, uh, a young cardiologist, I just saw so much sickness around me. Uh, I was in the hospitals and the hospitals are a revolving door. Someone has a heart attack. We tune them up. We send them out. They come back in later with either another heart attack or a drug reaction or heart failure, whatever it may be. And so I saw the frustration of working in the hospitals and I saw actually the ultimate demise of my own father. And my father would pass away from a Parkinson's-like illness at the age of 63. And toward the very end, I'm a few years into practice as a cardiologist. I see the sickness around me and in my father. And then I meet this young woman in her late 20s, and she is a doctor of chiropractic. And she starts telling me that the pharmaceuticals are worthless. The aspirin and the cholesterol drugs are all worthless. And the procedures we're doing are dangerous and harmful. And the whole medical system is a sham. <laughs> and most medical doctors would run, but I listened. I listened to what she had to say. Number one, she's smoking hot. If you've ever seen pictures of my wife, she is, at least to me no, and, and, to, and to many around the world as well. Number two, she had all the answers. We took my father to the Mayo Clinic. They had no idea why he was sick and no therapies for him. And now I meet this 20-something-year-old chiropractor, and she's got all the reasons why my father was sick and some suggestions for him to achieve some degree of longevity. And unfortunately, we reached him a little bit too late. Uh, he passed away at the age of 63, but his demise, meeting my uh, eventual wife, um, led to the man that I am to, uh, today with the message that I have to share with the world. Awesome. Awesome. Sometimes it takes those tragic events for people to, um, you know, open their eyes and kind of look a little closer and also, you know, stoke the fires of curiosity and, and look what else is out there. And for that, you're a man I admire to, you know, uh, look into the underlying root causes of things, uh, despite, you know, your profession not fully agreeing with that. And I've read your book and I understand the story. And um, I think it's good that you opened your eyes to these, uh, you know, these um, other, other issues that are related 
And if you look at our numbers today as an overall society, I mean, we are in real trouble. Um, the latest numbers I've looked at are estimated by 2035, which is uh, about 16 years away. We're looking at one in three kids with autism and up to 70% of the population of the adults having cancer. I mean, this is just ridiculous. And what we need is not necessarily more doctors. We need more people um, shifting their thoughts and their mindset to look at what they have to do to get the feeling better and being healthy and resilient. So, yeah, I would, I would totally agree. And I, I mean, obviously, most medical doctors are not inclined to do so because the money train is so good on the conventional side. That's number one, two, and three. And then number four, once again, is that how many people are going to believe that all the years they spent in the training, all the years they spent in practice are based on a faulty paradigm. They're based on on just the wrong methodology or, or the sickness model as opposed to the healthcare model. And my wife said, you know, it was like, you know, Dr. Gabe, it was like our first date. And she said, you've got to get out of the sickness world and get into the healthcare world. And, and that's where I chose to go. But, you know, kind of every, every one of us has their own, you know, backstory, either something happened to us personally and we found relief in the holistic health world and of course, you hear so many of those stories that why'd you become a chiropractor? Well, I mean, I was in high school and I was playing football and I hurt my back and I, my parents took me to a chiropractor and you know, lo and behold, I was better, you know, a few, you know, a few days or one adjustment or a few weeks or whatever it was later. And that's what stoked my interest. Or like myself, it was someone very, very close to me in the family uh, that suffered the illness and the conventional side had nothing. And then my eyes were open to the holistic world. Yeah, and I do remember the points that you um, were very clear on in the book. I remember you called your father the life of the party, and, and you were um, pretty upset with your profession on why you could not give him better answers and results. And I had a similar, um, I had a similar occurrence in my life. I was a Marine for eight years, and at the end of that, I had um, some pretty concerning health issues, uh, gut issues, traumatic brain issues, things like that, a lot of uh, post-traumatic stress. And it was ultimately a, a chiropractor that was a best practitioner who gave me my life back and it made me become obsessed with this, with this crazy world we're in today, you know? Well, I think, you know, you said it very well is that, you know, traumatic brain injury is so, so common and it's such the buzzword today in healthcare. And I think the people at the forefront of, of, of the healing and the recovery of TBI are the, are the doctors of chiropractic and there's, you know, obviously, you know, more and more, there's a whole specialty of chiropractic neurology that seems to have developed that really has found a home in the TBI uh, community. And I was just interviewed for the Brain Health Summit as well. And, uh, you know, once again, that's all about how to recover from TBI. And that summit is headed up by a doctor of chiropractic. So, uh, you know, obviously, in my practice as a, as a cardiologist, I don't see a lot of people coming to me to, with that, but I see a lot of people with what I would say is above, you know, above the shoulders issues, people yeah. with lightheadedness, dizziness, recurrent passing out episodes called syncope. And all of my patients have to be under the care of a chiropractor as well. But certainly I stay on top of all those people with, with those brain based issues uh, to make sure they're under chiropractic care. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so <clears throat> what I want to do now is kind of dive into this world of misinformation. I mean, there is so many, um, and I'm sure you see this a lot in your clinic, but on a regular basis, we have people come in and they've got lots of blood work and we ask them, you know, what was the doctor's recommendation off this blood work? And it's something, you know, like, Oh, they recommended a colonoscopy. You know, it, it's, it's kind of, um, a big at an attachment of what's being presented and what we can do to kind of look into those underlying factors. So what I would like to do is, um, ask your expertise on some of the misinformation. Um, can you explain a little bit to our listeners about some of the benefits of actually having high cholesterol? Yeah, sure thing. You know, I, I think so highly of cholesterol. That's why I put a chapter one into my book. So I want people to understand the truth about cholesterol. And then once we awaken someone's eyes to really tearing down, uh, you know, this, this mainstream tenet of medicine, like, and, and telling people, hey, cholesterol is a good thing. Now, once they understand 
that we've broken down that barrier. Now they're open to anything. Now they're going to understand that, you know, now we can start really tearing apart pharmaceuticals and we could talk about lifestyle. We could talk about nutrition, but first let's hit that cholesterol area. And, uh, you know, I want people to understand the importance of what cholesterol is, why the human body makes it, why every mammal on planet earth makes cholesterol. Why do eggs contain cholesterol? Why does human breast milk and the milk of every mammal on planet earth contain cholesterol, right? It's just a reason for this. And you can understand it from a biochemical standpoint, or you can just say, wow, you know what? That makes sense. I don't really need to understand uh, the textbook version. I just can, I can live in the world of common sense, the, the world that the medical doctors have left. The medical doctors have left the world of common sense for 150 years. So we want people to understand the importance of, of cholesterol. And then once again, in my office, we do the most advanced testing in the world, which is chapter two of my book that tells you about different parameters that measure for cholesterol, whether it's LDL, particle numbers, particle sizes, HDL, particle number and function, uh, you know, the ratios thereof. Uh, what, when people talk about measuring total cholesterol as far as heart risk, that's, that's 1970s you know, thinking. My, when my father you know, just started out, that's the stuff that mattered to them then, but it is such a poor measure of overall health and wellness. And finally, let me say, you know, talk about brain health. People with the highest levels of cholesterol uh, tend to have the best neurologic outcomes, the lowest risk of dementia, for example, which is pretty darn important for most people. Yeah, especially with some of the studies out there now that I've seen um, University of Virginia released one a while back that was a major cohort study, and they had some pretty dismal results. Uh, from, their, from their work, they concluded that if you live in America and you're 28 years old, you're already 100% of the population is already showing early cognitive sign dysfunction, neurological dysfunction, which is uh, very tragic. So dementia is affecting all of us. And cholesterol is definitely one of those things we need to keep. Uh, for our brain health, our brain is, you know, half fat, half cholesterol, um, as well as immunity. That's pretty surprising. There's some points I got out of your book, and it totally makes sense. I've seen patients with uh, chronic mono uh, that just can't get over that because of their cholesterol, you know, 140 or something like that. And not to really attack diets, but a lot of these people um, eat vegetarian, and they're just not going to get enough um, cholesterol from that to power their immunity to keep uh, small infections under control and ultimately give their brain the nourishment it needs. Uh, you know, th those, are, those are fantastic points, Doc, in, no doubt about it. And I do love to bash uh, vegans and vegetarianism. Uh, as I know, you're trying to be a little politically correct today, but um, I'm, I'm going to step outside of that box. I'm, I'm, always, I'm always politically incorrect. Definitely take the gloves off for that because I see a lot of people you know, struggling with that and uh, they need to know the truth, you know? Yeah. I mean, listen, you know, you know, doc, I mean, it's um, um, to me, it's all about living the paleo lifestyle and within that realm is paleo nutrition. And then once again, the other paleo lifestyle things, sunshine, sleep, uh, toxin and chemical and pollution avoidance, uh, being physically active, all that stuff is absolutely critical when it comes to living the paleo lifestyle, which I think uh, is synonymous with the chiropractic lifestyle. Now, whether or not all doctors of chiropractic live that lifestyle, that's the subject for another show. But uh, there's, there's many that do. And that's, th those are the people that I uh, speak you know, from the stage and anywhere possible to say that the doctor of chiropractic is your go-to for all things health and wellness. That's who you need to go see because they are uniquely skilled in that nutrition and the lifestyle as well. But just like anything, you got to make sure that you find someone that kind of resonates uh, you know, with those tenants as well. <clears throat> and, um, you know, certainly they can contact you and, and if, you know, if they're not in your area, then you'll know where to turn people on to. We've got a wide network. <clears throat> Oftentimes I just tell people, ask a friend. It's very likely that you have a friend who's under the care of a chiropractor. That's the perfect person for you to see. If you're in an emergency, go to an emergency room. But if you're looking for health and wellness and true prevention, go see your chiropractor. Excellent. And I will throw in um, a little bit of tidbit on that because I, I graduated from Cleveland Chiropractic College and amongst my colleagues that know me, I was there, I was engaged 
all my teachers know me and I worked very hard at getting the most thorough education I could. And to be quite blunt with you, it was incredibly inadequate for hitting the streets and getting people to feeling better. You know, they did teach you how to be competent with your hands and do the proper examination processes and determine, you know, who is not a good fit for chiropractic, but that's about it. And very, very basics in nutrition, despite uh, the heaviest trained ones of the uh, doctor profession, um, still, it was pretty inadequate. So I got my diplomat in nutrition to really help out with that. And you were, you were uh, interviewed by Dr. Grisanti quite a bit on that as well. So that helps out. And I think that an excellent point, find a chiropractor who's competent, that you trust, that um, gets a lot of referrals based on, on their work and not necessarily who's advertising and all that. You know, word of mouth is huge. And I think that that should be very much employed when it comes to choosing the right chiropractor for your needs. Well, you know, and, and let me just say, you know, one thing obviously is that as a, as a medical doc, you know, I did four years of osteopathic medicine, three years of internal, three years of cardiology. So I did an additional six years on top of the four year medical training. And you guys have four years of, 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 you know, of, of, you know, until you become a, a chiropractic physician, but I spent an additional six years honing my skills and my craft. And then of course, year in the years after that, learning the stuff I know now from a holistic standpoint and the holistic training that I've had. So you're right. I think that anybody comes out of four years of training and they've got a pretty good skill set, but in order to take it next level, you're right. Just like you did, whether you actually get certification as a diplomat in, in nutrition or you become a Dr. Google, and Dr. Google is a wonderful thing because Dr. Google takes you to the actual medical literature and to the books written by board-certified cardiologists like me where you can learn a lot. And then if you, uh, you, can, um, you can talk the talk, but you have to walk the walk. And I think where a lot of physicians in general fail, certainly in my standpoint, you know, I mean, who's going to listen to an overweight cardiologist about nutrition, is that you need to learn the talk, and then you've got to walk it as well. And, and I think that's so important. Absolutely. Um, another just tidbit on that was uh, one of the most fundamental things I've done that's really helped my clinic success, um, you know, 99% of our patients are off from referral, is I had several mentors. And I'm talking, you know, close to 200 mentors that I've worked with, shadowed, talked with that were much smarter than me and had had many of the, you know, walk the walk under their sleeve and they kind of passed along their gyms. And that was uh, absolutely fundamental. So again, just a little bit, every the little bit helps, you know, finding someone smarter than you and learning from. So, which is why I'm interviewing you as well. <laughs> um, so can you talk a little bit about um, what happens when someone has low cholesterol? What are some, what are some possible signs and symptoms that a person might have their cholesterol is too low? Well, I think, you know, it goes back to once again, as you mentioned, that cholesterol is in every single cell of the body, the cell membrane or that fence that encloses things in uh, inside the cell and keeps things outside of the cell that don't belong. So that relies on cholesterol. Our hormones, our sex hormones come from cholesterol. So if you're having any issues regarding uh, libido, erectile function, uh, things like, you know, cortisol comes from cholesterol. So fatigue, of course, would be very common there. Low blood pressure could be an issue there. Low energy, all that kind of stuff. Sleep issues, that could all be related to low cholesterol. Um, when it comes to uh, vitamin D production, vitamin D is, is made from cholesterol coursing through the skin. So if you do not have cholesterol, you cannot make vitamin D. And if you don't make vitamin D, well, there's just, you know, just about every single cell has vitamin D receptors as well. So now those receptors don't get activated to do all the magic that the vitamin D receptors are supposed to do. Uh, you can take a look at your digestion, right? So your, you know, your liver makes uh, cholesterol. It puts it into the uh, gallbladder as, as bile and bile salts, bile acids to help you emulsify or break down fat so you can absorb it. Well, how many people have digestive issues and we can stem it back to low cholesterol. So I don't think there's much of an issue with low cholesterol uh, aside from those people that are on pharmaceuticals. Uh, most people do not have low cholesterol uh, per the measurements, but uh, you know clearly it's, it's, uh, it's been known for over 45 years that 
very high cholesterol above 260 is linked to excess mortality. So a higher risk of dying when your total cholesterol is above 260. But most people don't know that below 160, your risk of dying is also very high. It's a, it's a J-shaped, almost a U-shaped curve to get into some, some statistics, which really highlights why low cholesterol is a problem as well. Yeah. <clears throat> so now looking into some components that, you know, we might see on a uh, simple blood test, you know, can you tell us a little bit more about LDL and what we could do to maybe improve that a little bit? Well, you know, once again, I think it just goes back to living the lifestyle. And, you know, it's kind of funny when people talk about paleo as being a fad. Well, paleo by definition means prehistoric, means old stone age or before recorded time. How is that possibly a fad? Everything else is just a fad. So we want to embrace that paleo lifestyle. Like I said, uh, can we all agree on the fact we should be eating organic food? So what, no matter where, whether it's, whether it's, uh, you know, vegan, vegetarian, paleo, Mediterranean, keto, just make it organic and then get all the chemicals out of the food. And that's a good start because chemicals, of course, lead to inflammation, oxidative stress. You mentioned immune function. So could it be that the pesticides in our food raise HDL? Of course, because HDL, or I'm sorry, LDL and HDL for that matter, because they're both part of the immune system. So if you are exposed to these things that are exciting the immune system, you're going to have abnormal lipids as well. So you can modify and improve the lipid profile just by eating organically. Awesome. And then uh, some other things. <clears throat> I mean, and I'm a huge fan of the paleo diet. I'm a huge fan. I've personally seen triglycerides go from the 700 range to the 900 range uh, down to 150 in just about six weeks time with just modifying their diet and, and doing the steps you just said, going uh, more organic. Um, but there's also some other things that you point out in your book that you need to really cut out to be paleo. Well, you know, I mean, listen, uh, to me, I think, you know, number one, you go organic. Number two, you go gluten-free. I think that's a fantastic start for most people and easy enough to accomplish. And then after that, after you kind of kick out the gluten, which is a small nasty protein found in wheat, barley, and rye, then of course you want to cut out any sources of excess sugar. You want to cut out things like corn and soy, which are not paleo foods. And then the next thing you're going to look to get rid of is dairy. Now, the Wolfsons, we enjoy raw dairy from healthy pasture-raised animals probably once a month um, with the understanding that it's not paleo, but there are some health benefits to it. And, and frankly, it is a treat for us. And if, if raw dairy is your treat in your life, I think you're going to do very well. Uh, paleo uh, ancestors did not... Uh, of course, drink alcohol, low sugar, no grain, as we mentioned, uh, you know, things like, you know, wheat, corn, and soy. Uh, and, uh, and the more you follow that plan, I think the better your health will, will be. Um, but, uh, you know, we see fantastic results with that. And then once again, you pair that with, um, uh, you know, paleo, you know, nutrition, pair that with a paleo lifestyle with going to sleep with the sundown, awaking before the sunrise, getting sun exposure morning, noon, and afternoon. Uh, even on a cold day in Kansas City, you can get outside bundled up and just even if you, all you did is get your eyeballs into the sun, get your eyes even on a cloudy day, just letting the power of light coming in through your eyes into your retina to the back of your brain to do some amazing things, including making melatonin. But you know what? You can understand the science and you and I can talk science for hours and hours and hours, or you can just once again, go back to the school of common sense. How, how did we live for a million years and try and bring that into the 21st century? Love it. I love it. Especially the, uh, the points about the light. Um, since I've realized how important light is for us in our exposure and ultimately making vitamin D from uh, cholesterol and squalene. Um, I've, I've went outside, like yesterday was a great example. It was very nice here in Kansas. And I was at the park with my children and I've made a point to not wear sunglasses anymore unless I really have to, but I drive around with no sunglasses. I still find myself reaching for them, but I think it's more of almost like a fashion statement, but I welcome that bright light into my eyes. And like you said, it does a lot of cool things, activates the pineal gland, 
It even has effect on our thyroid. And we're in the winter months when we have a lot less light, uh, less light, a lot of drop in vitamin D. People's moods go straight to the toilet. So that light is extremely important. Yeah, and I think also is that kind of uh, you know if you, uh, you know kind of a, a paradox, if you will. I mean, certainly some of the healthiest people in the world live as close to the equator, and uh, uh, you know once again, you know, as as you know, could high cholesterol, uh, as diagnosed by a physician, could high cholesterol be from a sunshine deficiency? The answer is yes, because sunshine turns that cholesterol into vitamin D and vitamin, you know, but it's not just about, you know, sunshine does so much more, of course, than vitamin D production. So, so much more, but the eyes and the skin are solar panels. They're, they are built and designed to collect that electrical energy and turn it into chemical energy in the body. Like you said, to do amazing things for the pineal and the pineal as it affects the thyroid, the pineal affects everything. So it secretes melatonin and melatonin is that, that circadian rhythm uh, monitor, that, that clock in the body, that signal from the, from the brain that signals to the rest of our glands and tissues to, to get things moving. So that's certainly very important. But, um, you know, the, the artificial light thing, the blue light, uh, that's why we should go to sleep with the sun down and we awake before the sunrise and then boom, we're into our day. But you mentioned the sunglasses as well as a fashion statement. And the, uh, you know, when I moved out to Arizona from Chicago in 2002, that's one of the first things you do is you get a big, you know, fancy, you know, pair of sunglasses, really cool. And they're always handy to throw those on. But uh, yeah, as you mentioned, I haven't worn sunglasses about seven or eight years. And uh, I embrace that, that light coming into the eyes. I, I mean, it's almost, it's almost to a fault now where it's like, I w- you know, even, even when I go skiing, that I try and spend as much time without wearing goggles while skiing uh, to embrace that power of the light. Yeah, I mean, remarkable, remarkable changes occur when we have light. Um, I've seen some studies that with soldiers, okay, they, they were sitting indoors and when they had regular, just conventional light bulbs hanging and they fed a meal, then they gave them full spectrum light and they ate the exact same meal. They actually absorbed 15% more calcium just with increased light in an indoor setting. I mean, that's phenomenal. So embracing that sunlight, uh, avoiding the shades, I think is just one of the best steps. And you've, Michigan, you've done that for seven years. I'm on my, uh, I'm on my first year of doing that. So I'm, I'm about six behind you, but I'm on the way. And I can actually tell a difference. And I've actually influenced my wife, Tiffany, to where she doesn't wear sunglasses anymore, too. So... Great. Well, you can, uh, you know, take those sunglasses, put them on eBay and see what you can get for them. But, uh, you know, the other thing that I also want to mention too, Doc, that's really important in the wintertime that I really stress to people is, uh, is eating seafood. And seafood has very high levels of vitamin A, not like beta carotene, like eating carrots, but actual functional vitamin A that works. Uh, and then the other thing, of course, is that it has functional vitamin D. So, Countries like Iceland uh, and and things that are farther away, you know, to more more towards polar locations, those people actually can do very well when they're eating a lot of seafood. So they may not be getting light at this time of year. So, you know, so people listening to this interview and maybe they're based in you know, Edmonton and it's like, well, what am I supposed to do? I, I live, you know, at high latitude. I'm getting no sunshine this time of year. How do I stay healthy? Am I sucking down bottles of vitamin D? The answer is, well, you know, vitamin D supplementation has some evidence that it's beneficial, but of course, get that sun whenever possible. But number two, eat a lot, a lot of seafood, which has functional quant- uh, quantities and qualities of vitamin D. Excellent. Excellent. Love it. <clears throat> I'm glad you're agreeing with me, Doc, because you're a former Marine and I wouldn't want to upset you, you know? Well, here's the thing. Uh, no, I, I, I've seen literature that completely coincides with what you're saying. And what's, what's kind of striking is um, I've seen reviews of Iceland people where you're talking about low light, um, you know, in the, in the winter months. But these people have, interestingly, the lowest case of depression across the globe. Uh, have you heard that before? Yeah, I know. And, and, and I specifically, I agree with you. Iceland is one of those blue zones where people there live forever. And for those of us that are like really big on the light, uh, I don't want to say hypothesis. It's just, it's just common sense and it's reality. But then it's like, how do you come up with that paradox? How do you come up with those outliers? And then, of course, it's been identified that it's probably the seafood that's, that's doing it. First of all, they are active outdoors no matter what the weather is. 
the other thing, of course, you know, once again, is that in, whether it's Iceland or it's the health of the Eskimos, it's because they're, they're getting it from animal products. And I think it's, you know, very important once again to eat that seafood. So you are getting all that nutrients from the sea. That's just, uh, it's just so, so, so valuable. And, and you mentioned a good point of the difference between maybe a synthetic and a functional um, actual vitamin, like functional vitamin A, you know, functional vitamin D. And there's a lot of synthetics out there that actually are toted as big, but they can actually increase toxicity. To get the functional food, as far as I understand, we don't even have the intelligence to know what we're making and what we're duplicating when we're trying to make vitamins. There's, there's uh, trace enzymes and polyphenols and cofactors that we just haven't discovered that contribute to a therapeutic effect when you eat that whole food product. So I agree with you a thousand percent. Awesome. So uh, now let's talk just briefly um, about some things that are completely not diet related. Okay. Some heart clot, some clotting factors that we see a lot of um, like protein a kind of, what are your thoughts on that? Well, lipoprotein A, it's uh, certainly very interesting, and I write about that in my book, and I write blog posts on it, and a lot of people are touched by it because uh, lipoprotein A, or what's, what's called LP little A, is found in about 10% of the population, and it in increases cardiovascular risk, increases blood clotting risk, increases stroke risk, increases risk of valvular heart disease, such as aortic stenosis. So it is something very important that everybody gets identified. And it is something that is genetically linked. Either one, of your, one or both of your parents had this. And it can be a little difficult to modify uh, not impossible, but you don't know unless you check, right? So you start at time zero and knowing your LP little a, and then you try your diet and lifestyle modification, which of course includes chiropractic care and then retest three months down the road and see how you did. And then depending on your risk factors, uh, probably the first supplement I would reach toward, would be a time release niacin as far as modifying LP little a. Uh, and then of course, because LP little a is linked to blood clotting. That's where number one, you want to make sure you do everything else on the up and up. And then you may want to consider depending on your history, some form of a natural clot buster, like a natto kinase or a lumbro kinase. Awesome. Yeah. And, and what's startling to me is I see um, LPAs. I had a patient this month, at LPA 350. Um, and I've also seen it, uh, you know, 250 in young people. Um, in their you know mid thirties, so this is uh, pretty startling stuff, and and this is something that they really need to be educated about because again, it ex it completely escapes traditional medicine. I think it's also you know it's kind of like a kick in the ass too, doc. You know where it's it's hey, listen, you know your um, uh, you know your LP little a's high. There's not much we can do about it. And therefore, you have to do everything else possible, right? You got to live the lifestyle. You got to do everything else you can. So it's kind of like this warning sign to these people. Hey, listen, you've got this issue going on. You better do everything else on the up and up. You know, it's kind of like if you were to talk to a smoker and they're like, I'm never giving up smoking. Like, okay, then don't give up smoking. But then you got to do everything else very well. And, and uh, you know, not to promote smoking, of course, but there are islands in the South Pacific where everybody smokes, yet they enjoy incredible health because they're eating, uh, they're eating seafood, they're eating coconuts, they're eating vegetables, they're living outdoors, they're getting tons of sun, they sleep with nature, their only fault is cigarettes, and it doesn't appear to bother them. So, you know, once again, it's okay to have a couple faults, you know, a couple chinks in the armor, as long as everything else is pretty strong, you'll, uh, you'll do well. But, um, you know, let me throw this out there too, is that you know, why does nature produce that LP little a? And once again, it's a nasty LDL particle that's loaded with lipids and, um, uh, you know, is known to wreak havoc on the body. Yet, why, why do 10% of the people genetically have that? There has to be some reason. There has to be actually some benefit of how genetic selection has allowed people like that to propagate. There's got to be some benefit to it. I, I don't know what it is, but if I find it out, I will make sure to let you know and I'll let the world know. Yeah, I understand. And, you know, for some kind of protective mechanism, um, you know, just like, uh, you know, getting exposure to early viruses can give you protection from cancer later on. I, I, I imagine it's some kind of um, something in nature we haven't quite figured out yet, but it has some kind of protecting mechanisms and just got to keep an eye on that and, and you know, see what happens. <clears throat> well, 
like you said too, the other thing, I mean, you know, kind of like the classic example would be a sickle cell, you know, disease or sickle cell trait, which is so common in African Americans. But what, uh, what can be catastrophic as far as a, an acute hemolytic anemia, uh, actually that sickle cell trait helps to prevent people from malaria. So, you know, once again, it's just a matter of, you know, what that, you know, LP little A's, but, it, but until then, let's focus on strategies to, uh, number one, live the healthiest lifestyle with LP little A, and then we could talk about ideas to, to lower it. Awesome. And I love that. Uh, I love that you pointed out the islands with the population to do that. I myself actually had the chance to visit a blue zone in Okinawa years ago, and I, it, I'll never forget this. And this has been one of the reasons that's propelled me to do this work I do, is I witnessed a man 105 years old sprawl into a horse and ride around cutting coconuts out of a tree with a machete in his hand. And he had the biggest grin on his face that you could imagine, 105. So again, they, the communities, the high mineral water, lots of plants in their diet, um, lots of, lots of um, good, Seafood. lots of good signaling. Yeah, you know, and, um, you know, it's, I, I like to, you know, remind people of the movie Castaway with Tom Hanks. You know, whenever like someone trots out like genetics and stuff like that, I'm like, listen, if you lived on the island with Tom Hanks, in the movie Castaway, with the you know, it's you, Tom Hanks, and the volleyball Wilson, and the three of you on that on that island, and you're eating coconuts and seafood and vegetables, and you're sleeping with the sun down and waking before the sunrise and watching the sunrise, and you're out in the sun in and out all day long, and you're in a chemical pollution free environment, you'll never get sick. You will never get sick. You will live until you're 140, and then you won't wake up one day. And what we try and advise people on is just try and find that island, find as close as you can to that island, and you'll do very well. Excellent. Love it. So I just want to briefly touch on uh, C-reactive protein. What are your thoughts on that? So C-reactive protein is, is the most well-known marker of, of inflammation as it relates to cardiovascular issues. So the higher your inflammation, the higher your risk of cardiac, of cancer, of autoimmune, of dementia and brain-based diseases. So inflammation is a bad thing. And the medical doctors know that. They know that inflammation is a problem, but their answer is aspirin and statin drugs and blood pressure drugs. That, that is their answer. Their answer is steroids. Their answer is, is ibuprofen and Tylenol for the pain related inflammation. But doctors like you and I go after the cause of why there's inflammation. So if we find elevated CRP, the, the answer is not, hey, let's find something to make the CRP low. It's a matter of why is the body inflamed? Why is the body irritated? And then you just march back to the basic principles of getting people on organic paleo nutrition, the sun, the sleep, the chiropractic care, avoiding the uh, pollution and chemicals. And then the inflammation is going to go bye-bye. It's just pretty simple. And then, of course, we, you, know, you and I both have the patients that we can show all the different testimonials and all the, hey, listen, we tested them at time zero. CRP was high. Put them on the plan. They followed the plan. Evidence-based supplements can play a role in that as well. And then we test them at day 90 and inflammation is gone. Yeah, I, I love it. Um, and it's, it's a regular occurrence in here too to see people come from Cleveland, May, uh, Cleveland Clinic or, or Mayo Clinic and their CRPs in the 50s and 60s. And that's what we have to do is get them back in touch with nature, get them outside, get them in sunlight, um, get them familiar with grounding and not only that, but teach them how to actually appreciate things because that mindset goes a long ways. Um, I've seen, I've seen uh, patients over the, over the years that do everything. They take the vitamin D, they take the magnesium, they take all the supplements, but they have such poor relationships, perhaps with a spouse or someone else, that nothing really curbs that inflammation. So it's important to find something to be grateful for. And, and you got to love yourself so you can be around someone who appreciates you. And that's that can do a lot and then really enhance the, uh, enhance the supplementation. Yeah, that's a great you know, point. Obviously, listen, supplements are there to supplement the healthy lifestyle. But I wrote chapter five of my book, One Nation Under Prozac. Really, I put it early on in the book and I want everybody to understand how mental health and poor mental health, anxiety, stress, depression, anger is so linked 
uh, to cardiovascular disease. And then of course you can put, you know, you as a former Marine, uh, you know, you know, put in a, a post-traumatic stress disorder in there. We mentioned traumatic brain injury, all those things that once again, wreak havoc on, on mental health and wellness. And if we don't recover that, well, then your risk of cardiovascular issues is much higher. But um, let me just kind of segue real quick too, is that you know the uh, us us survive those of us that survived over over thousands and thousands of years, and now we're a paleo person living in uh, you know ten thousand years ago. The people with the quickest immune system would survive. The people with the quickest immune system that would produce all that inflammation would survive because now your immune system is primed and ready. So if you got injured, uh, you know, you were, you were going to recover faster. And that's how genetically how we made it through those years. Well, the problem is now is that those of us that are we don't, we're not necessarily subject to acute stress, but it's chronic stress. And that chronic stress stokes inflammation and immune system activity. We think we are always just about to get injured. Therefore, our immune system is always on hyperdrive leading to inflammation. I think that's a very interesting hypothesis, you know, that I heard a couple of years ago. And, you know, once again, it just, it makes common sense. Yeah, that has to do with uh, just living the American lifestyle and being in chronic inflammation. Our diet promotes chronic inflammation. Our lifestyle promotes inflammation of just waking up, getting out the house, saying goodbye to your loved ones, maybe perhaps doing a job that brings you no purpose or, doesn't light a fire inside of you. Um, and it just kind of leads to the road of chronic inflammatory Western style diseases. Um, and inflammation is, is, it's important to recognize inflammation is not necessarily the bad guy. Um, acute inflammation versus chronic inflammation, I think has to do with the breakdown of communication within the body. If you're in chronic inflammation, your cells, your, your microbiome, all your immune, um, immune suppressors are no longer talking. So they're just kind of at each other, and it, that's what's going to leave you down the road of disaster. Yeah, uh, you know, most certainly, and uh, you know, certainly. So you know, I I'm I'm a I'm a left brain kind of guy. I'm not the right brain kind of guy, and I encourage all my patients in my practice to make sure that they you know, get under the care of uh, you know if, there, if there's ad- issues that need to be addressed. And so many times there are get under the care of a psychologist, a social worker, a life coach, a health coach. Uh, get somebody in your life that you can really talk some of these issues through in a professional manner, and uh, we've seen so much benefit, uh, you know, from that as I'm sure you have as well. Oh yeah, excellent, excellent. Um, so when it comes to, uh, I just got a few more questions for you, doctor. When it comes to our genetically modified foods and the contamination of glyphosate, you know, that's estimated. Glyphosate is now estimated to be in 75% of our rainfall. What are some problems we can expect to see with cardiovascular issues uh, with this? Well, there's so many things that glyphosate from, uh, uh, you know, pesticide, you know, found in Roundup, uh, which, uh, you know, of course, is sprayed over all crops. I mean, you can just consider if it's not organic, it's got a significant amount of glyphosate on there. Glyphosate just interferes with the function of the body uh, at a cellular level, at a, at a, a uh, tissue level as far as the gut is concerned uh, and leaky gut uh, is, is related, of course, to glyphosate exposure. And that's why I say no matter what diet you follow, let's just agree on the organic thing. So if you're into coffee, drink organic coffee. If your thing is ice cream, eat organic ice cream. Get the glyphosate, all the poisons out of the body. Of course, uh, the pesticides are, just, are, are designed to kill pests. Well, they're also going to kill your gut microbiome. And everybody these days are talking about uh, probiotics and all the benefits thereof. And glyphosate is a killer of the gut microbiome. Yeah. Um, just, to, just to be clear, um, I know this is back to common sense, but I just want to hear from the expert himself. When someone has a stint done, they're not free and clear, right? No, certainly not. It's kind of like when people say they've had bypass surgery and now their arteries are good. No, they're not good. They're actually horrible and may, in, in this scenario, maybe even be worse and they're not natural. So, um, you know, a stent opens up that particular part of the diseased vessel, but the whole vessel is diseased. All of your arteries are diseased. If it's already become significant enough in one area to necessitate a stent, well, there's disease everywhere else. And st- in, in the face of a heart attack, 
uh, stenting helps, but stenting never helps prevent heart attacks. So prevention is everything that we just talked about. Prevention is when you go to see your functional chiropractor. That's prevention, not getting stented. Yeah, excellent. Um, I've got um, maybe a few more questions. What can we expect to see with this increase in EMF uh, negativity that we're exposed to. And there's some companies I know in this area that have definitely dumped to 5G already. Uh, how does EMF affect the heart? Well, I'll, you know, quite simply, all the electronics, all the, uh, the cell phone towers, the Wi-Fi, the satellites, uh, 4G, 5G, you know, whatever we're talking about, that's all electricity. And the heart is an electrical organ as well. The brain is electrical. The muscles, you know, the human body is electrical. So the more uh, non-native electrical forces you put into the body will affect the human body. And the reality is, is that there is very little research that is done on the safety of, of, of the electronic or the, the, uh, the electric, uh, the electromechanical, uh, you know, fields. Uh, but there are scientists, you know, if you Google Martin Paul, P-A-L-L, Ph.D., out of uh, Washington, uh, you know, he's doing a lot of uh, research and he's got a lot of data and he's got a TED talk on, on the dangers of EMF uh, to the human and then also articles written on specifically what it does to cardiovascular uh, sickness. And I'm trying to get him for my podcast, The Healthy Heart Show. Uh, he's a pretty busy man, but we'll get him on and we're going to talk about all the dangers of EMF as it relates to cardiovascular issues. But uh, in short, avoid it as much as possible. And yeah, you're not going to move to that island with Tom Hanks, but at least turn off your Wi-Fi at night. It's pretty easy. Yeah, yeah. Looking forward to hearing that podcast. So, um, so what's the best, simplest way for people to get hold of your book? Uh, you know, for the book, I'd love you know, for you to come to my website. And actually, right now, we've got the book available for free. Um, uh, all you got to do is pay shipping and handling, and you'll see that come up on the, on the you know, website. I would appreciate your support as opposed to going to Amazon. Amazon doesn't need your support. I think that uh, us holistic providers do. So the book is available at the doctorswolfson.com, and doctors is abbreviated DRS. And of course, we're on social media, Facebook, Instagram. My podcast is called thehealthyheartshow.com. And then uh, if you're looking for information about natural immunity for your children, we've got a website called vaccinefreekids.com. And you get a lot of our uh, vaccine information there as well. Excellent. Excellent. So the, um, the contacts that you just mentioned, are, are that, is that the preferable way to uh, for people to get a hold of you if they have a question or they'd like to um, look closer into your services? Yeah, certainly. Head over to the doctorswolfson.com. We got everything over there. And, uh, you know, I, I try and put as many tentacles out there into the world to let people know that someone like me exists and there are alternatives to, <clears throat> to you know, to your local cardiologist. Uh, and that alternative is me. Excellent. Excellent. Love that message. Um, Thank you again for your time today. It's been a real pleasure having you here. Um, I will stay tuned to that podcast. And uh, again, thank you for, for taking the time out and, and giving us some insight on what we can do to protect ourselves, doctor. Thank you so much, doc. It was appreciate being on with you. Awesome. You take care. All right, you too.